Father, we thank you for the place we are today. We thank you, Father, that that your redemptive work and your proclamation of your mysteries um, has, has been an ongoing thing. And, and today we stand, we, we trust in the future. We trust that, that you, um, we, as I've heard it said, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. That brings us great joy. And we know, Lord, that you have been the Lord of the past as well. We thank you, Father, for testimony and strength. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue uh, to favor the ministries of this church and all churches in the city. We pray, Father, a blessing now upon the Holy Word, the the Bible. Uh, We pray, Lord, for its inspiration used by the Holy Spirit, that we could commune with Jesus Christ, the same Lord who's been Lord of this church since 1901, when you called us together and assembled us. We praise your name for this and say all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got one more request for Father, uh, please pour into me the gift of preaching, as always, and pour into your church a Holy Spirit gifting to be hungry for you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Today we are in uh, Luke 24. This is called the Road to Emmaus. This is the day that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and he began a series of showing up in real time, in people's lives, and almost saying, surprise, or greetings, and he did it uniquely to each person. And I think, real quick, have y'all seen any of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe movies, read the Narnia books, C.S. Lewis? One thing you'll consistently see from Aslan, who is Jesus, one thing you'll consistently see is Aslan telling other people, I only tell you your story. I'm not here to tell you everyone's story. I'm not here to, for you to, to, to read, the, the, to see everyone's laundry and know everything about everyone in the church. I'm here to talk to you. I think it's interesting how often we want to know what's going on in everyone else's life without knowing what God's doing in our life. Um, and so this happened to two men. There's some parallels to be drawn to us, but this is their story. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up, walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas answered or asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem, and do you not know the things that have happened there in the past days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and in deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who is going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but did not find his body. They came and they told us that they have seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? 
They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Amen. So as this begins, you've got two guys uh, walking, and the Greek puts two words together that are a strange combination, but I think it's, it's very descriptive of many of us. First, it says these two guys, and it uses this word um, to show that they had a long-term relationship as a conversation partner. He's describing that one or two people you have that you talk to all the time, that's the person you call, that's the person you text, it's the person you go get coffee with. These two men have a long-term relationship where they're consistently having an ongoing conversation. The second word that's used is debate. They're kind of arguing. I've, I've joked that disciples of Christ have three sacraments, baptism, communion, and arguing. Uh, they're debating. They're, they're hashing it out. They're talking uh, so they have a long-term relationship where they talk to each other, and then they are engaging in an ongoing debate as well, particularly debating what just took place. One way to look at this is that they were both preaching at each other. You ever been preached at? Are you being preached at? <laughs> you're getting, I mean, you're pre- where you preach what you think, and someone's preaching what they think, and you're declaring, proclaiming the truth as you know it. That's what they're doing. Well, Scripture says, in this state, Jesus Christ um, appeared to them. He came up and walked along them. They didn't know it was Jesus. They were kept from seeing him. And so Jesus said, what are you discussing together as you walk? In the Greek, he's saying, what words are you exchanging back and forth? It's almost like, I don't want to use weirdness, but kind of regurgitating. Like, it's a, y'all aren't getting anywhere, are you? Like, you're talking in circles. What are you, what are your, what are you saying? What, what words are you back and forthing? And it said they stood still and their faces were downcast. Now, it appears that Jesus is saying, I want to know what you see and what you know. But what he's really asking is, tell me what you haven't seen. Tell me what you don't know. The men begin to say, Well, here's what we know. There is a man named Jesus. He was a good man. He's from Nazareth. He was a prophet. He told the truth. He was powerful. His words were good, and so were his deeds. Many people gathered around him, and so did God. God approved what he was doing. They went on to say, but the problem is, you see, at the height of his ministry, the worst thing possible happened. He was taken, and he was crucified, and he's dead. It's gotten so bad now that it's the third day. And the Jewish custom was back then, within three days, there could be a miracle where your life could come back. You might be in a coma, uh, the Lazarus thing, where you could come back to life, resuscitated. Because it was the third day, even in their customs, these men were saying, Jesus is irrevocably dead unchangeably dead. They go on to say, to the living Lord, (laughs) they tell him, and even more, his body's missing. Someone said they saw an angel or something, that he's alive, and so we went to go see, and all there is is a missing body, and here we are, talking. Jesus is saying, what don't you see? And what they don't see is him. They don't believe in a living Lord. As we begin this story, Jesus has located that part of us that isn't founded upon loving Christ and walking with him based on his work and resurrection. Instead, we look at him as a life coach. That part of us that's attracted to Jesus' teaching, to what he did, to what he said, to what he meant to so many people... But after that, we're about stuck. 
that part of us that either believes today or used to believe that the primary means, the primary reason Jesus came was to show us how to be better human beings, how to progress. We don't live and rely upon Jesus being resurrected from the dead, having died on the cross intentionally. Instead, we focus on his life and his ministry. I hear that a whole lot. We, why do we need the cross? Why do we need the blood? Preacher, can you, I had somebody even ask me at our last church, can we do communion but leave the word blood out? Like, let's just not do communion. We don't like the body and the blood part. What do you, what do you want, Oreos and milk? You know. There's a temptation to be attracted to the man from Nazareth, to Jesus Christ. There's a temptation to be attracted to what he said and what he does, to treat him as the means of being a coach for us, a guide for us, a life coach, so that we can learn how to live our lives better, we can obey his teachings, and if we obey his teachings, then there'll be peace on earth. Not if you've thought that before and even kind of still think that a little bit. Yeah. Right? I mean, that, that's, that's, that's in us. But when Jesus showed up, he heard these men preaching at each other. They just spent a long time walking behind Jesus. They were probably two of the 70 that were sent as missionaries. They weren't the original 12, but Jesus had other missionaries. They saw him. They knew him. They'd come close to him. So they're preaching, memorizing, memorizing him, talking about him. But when Jesus shows up and he says, hey, what are you preaching? Their immediate response was to stop walking and to put their head down in tears. That's a pretty good gospel. The gospel of crying. The gospel of death. That is always going to be the conclusion of believing in the teachings of Jesus without believing he's alive. Believing in the teachings of Jesus, the, the, the power of Jesus, uh, the, 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 the miracles of Jesus, the, the hopes of Jesus, without believing that he's actually been raised from the dead, he's ascended on high, he's enthroned, and he is sovereign. That sermon still is preached, and it's always ending up with tears. How do y'all feel right now? about the state of the human race. Feel pretty good? We're good? Good to go? Possible war with South Korea or North Korea at some point? Uh, hatred? Figuring out, calling people illegal, illegal people? Fighting over, I mean, completely split, upset, distrustful. We don't trust our leaders. If we had leaders on the other side, we wouldn't trust them either. How do you, how do you feel about the human race right now? Have we progressed? I mean, our, I know we can uh, talk to people up in the International Space Station. I know we can fly across the United States on a jet in, in just a couple hours. But have we gotten any more decent? Is there any more peace? Jesus Christ did not come primarily to be a life coach to teach us how to live our lives and then there would be utopia. If that's what we believe, if that's what your heart is set on, ultimately that part of you that believes that will end up walking alone on a seven-mile walk, crying, looking at the ground. Our hope is not in the human race getting our act together. That's who Jesus met. He met two men who were enamored with what he taught and where he came from, from Nazareth, with, with all of his miracles and signs, but they didn't see the most important part. And that's what Jesus is here to show them. Jesus listened to their preaching. And then in a way that only Jesus could do, begins his reply with, how foolish you are. <laughs> Thanks. How foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. It's first sentence. How foolish you are. How slow of heart to not believe that all, this, all the things that the prophets have spoken. Another way to say that is, why are you putting so much weight on your intelligence and your own preaching and your own ability to predict the ways of the world? Why are you putting so much weight and authority on what you think happened in Jerusalem? And putting no weight on the scriptures and the prophets in the days of old, Moses and the likes of them. Why? How foolish you are. 
to completely throw out any external authority and believe that you're your own authority, that truth resides in you. How foolish you are to, to, to look at a scenario and, and, and interpret it on your own when these things have been prophesied. Here's a sermon right there. Not trusting what is written, not trusting what was promised, not trusting what was spoken. All we do is trust on how we feel, on what we think. How foolish you are, says Jesus, to not believe. How slow of heart you are to not believe. Then he goes on, he says two sentences. That, then the next thing. Did not the Christ have to die? Did not the Christ have to suffer all of the things you mentioned and then enter his glory? Did you not... Did you... Jesus doesn't say a thing about all the things that Christ would say and teach, all the things that Christ would show and reveal, all the things. Jesus explicitly said, this is why the Son of God came to earth, the Christ, to die. Whereas your preaching, he says to them, says that the worst thing that happened was the cross. Jesus says the best thing that happened was the cross. While you say the cross is a nuisance, but he died on a cross. And he's still dead. And even though the angel said he's alive, wait a minute, it's his life. But I don't believe them. He's still dead. And the women said he's alive, but I don't believe them either. He's dead. And because he's dead, the worst thing that happened was his death on the cross. And the best thing that happened was what he taught. So let's remember what he taught. And Jesus said, no, the best thing that happened is that the Son of Man came to die on the cross so that your sins could be imputed onto Him and His righteousness could be imputed onto you and you could have life in His name. And then listen to His teachings. That's what Jesus said. One of the biggest transformations I went through as a Christian was when I quit fighting the atonement. Scripture says that the cross is offensive. Embrace it. I had all the arguments. How could God? He's a he's a a child abuser. How could he how how could he do that to his own kid? How could he send Jesus to die on the cross? And I also thought, if God is truly sovereign and he's truly good, why does he have to do it through death? Why can't he do it another way? Have you thought these things? Like what, what what's the deal? consistently offended. I can't believe in that. I can't believe in that. I love Jesus. I love what he taught. I love that he's raised from the dead, but I cannot believe that the cross has any value. I've been there. That's what these guys were. Take out the cross, everything's fine. Add the cross, everything's ruined. And Christ Jesus says, if you don't embrace the cross by faith, if you can't get over the offense... And just cling to it? If you can't claim the blood of Jesus, even though that's a foreign concept to you, you don't understand it, if you can't do that, then none of the scriptures will make sense. And when I break bread, you won't see me. Don't you know that the Son of God, the Christ, had to suffer these things? And don't you know that this was part of his glorification? Jesus Christ is not our life coach. He's not primarily a blueprint at a do-it-yourself seminar. He's not Google. I want to build a a headboard. Google it. That's do-it-yourself. Build the headboard. Here's how you do it. Christ isn't... He doesn't show you how to do life, and that's the only reason he came. Jesus Christ came to live the life you could not live, to fight the fight you could not fight, to defeat the enemy you could not defeat. He did what you couldn't do. And so these men walked, and they heard their preaching quit, and they heard Jesus preach. Wouldn't you love to hear him preach himself? They heard Jesus Christ preach. And then it says Jesus opened the scriptures to their eyes from Moses, the prophets, and all the rest, and he explained to them that if you grab hold, if you, quit, if you quit cursing the cross and cling to the cross, everything makes sense. He dealt with the reality that we see in St. Paul's writings, that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's a stumbling block to the wise, but it's the power of God for those who are being saved. 
Jesus said foundationally at day one, the cross, the cross is it. If you flash back about three or four months before that, he was on the road to Jerusalem before the cross. And one of his best disciples, Peter, they were walking together and Jesus said, hey, what do people say? Who do people say I am? And Peter said, well, some people say you're a prophet. And Jesus said to Peter, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, God's son. And Jesus was taken back. He said, well, Peter, (laughs) flesh and blood didn't teach you that. That's from God. Well done. But then Peter went on to say, or Jesus went on to say, now that you see that, now that you've confessed that I'm the Christ, you know these things then, right? Maybe God told you this too. Great, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and we're going to have a great festival, and we're going to have a great time there, and I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be spit upon, I'm going to be whipped, I'm going to die on a cross. Right? You've read the Bible, right, Peter? I mean, God, you talked to God, right? He just told you I'm the Christ, so you know this part too? And then Peter said, forbid it, Lord. That cross business? No, no. You're the Christ who's going to come and teach us how to live. You're the Christ who's going to come and dominate the Romans. You're the Christ who's going to come and, and give us the life that we can predict. You're that kind of Christ. And, and he, don't talk about a cross. That's what Peter said. Quit talking about the cross. And Jesus looked at him and said, get behind me. Peter? Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Could it be, could it be that Jesus, even before he took the cross, before he clinged to that rugged cross, before he did that, he saw and predicted and prophesied that one of the most perverted, twisting, false gospel preaching that's going to come is trying to do Christianity without the cross. You see that? Could it be that he called it right then? First proclamation, he's the Christ. Awesome. And in weakness, get behind me, Satan, as in Satan's there. Satan showed up. The same Satan that was going to sift him like wheat showed up and said, yes, but no cross. He's dealing with the same thing in the story. He's dealing with this and the same thing in your heart to say, quit trying. And I'm... I'm a lefty too. I was raised in the far left and I, and I love the teachings of Jesus and hippie Jesus and let's be nice to everyone and all that. I get that. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked. I get that. Social justice. I love that stuff. But Jesus is saying, you cannot have a deep relationship with me unless it's on the basis of my cross as central. Get over it. Embrace it. Do you love me or do you love the version that you've built about me? And so Jesus, taking the cross, taking the atonement, taking this truth that's God's mystery executed by Jesus perfectly, Jesus takes it, and now the Bible makes sense. All the scriptures make sense. And then he went home with these guys. He's going to walk on, and the guys say, hey, it's getting late. You shouldn't walk out on the road by yourself. They don't know it's Jesus. He can do whatever he wants. But he says, okay, I'll come in. And he reclines with them, and he, and he, and he, and he gets to know them. And it says that their hearts were open to them. Open in Greek is only used eight times, this exact word. It's the same opening, which is the same uh, used for an opening of a womb or the opening of the heavens. It says their hearts were open to him, as in the full process. If any of you all birthed the baby before, you know, that's a process. It's not, it's not without pain. And the hearts are opened. They're fully aware. They're seeing Christ. And then the bread's broken, and Jesus physically appears to them. And I'll tell you what happened in that moment. And it's something that's happened to me. Jesus of Nazareth in that moment became Jesus Christ. Who do you say that I am? Jesus of Nazareth has to become Jesus Christ for you. He's not... I mean, he'll, he'll guide you and he'll give you some, some guidance and all that. It's the Holy Spirit. But Jesus Christ, the anointed, the Messiah, was not a life coach primarily. He is the Savior. That's why we say, when anyone joins the fellowship, do you believe that Jesus is the 
Christ. Not, do you believe that Jesus is a prophet? Or do you believe that Jesus did a lot of good things? Or do you believe that everyone lived like Jesus? We'd have peace. But it's not in there. It's, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, Lord and cross? Day one, Jesus Christ, when the gospel was being drilled into the church, day one, he dealt with the problem of Peter, that the cross is not to be rejected. It's not the worst thing that happened. It was necessary. It was his greatest work. It's painful. It's ugly. It's bent. It's cold. It's hard because it's sinful. It's covered in your sin. I don't want to look at my sins either. But to leave the cross out is to reject the work and supremacy of the work of Jesus Christ. And so this Easter, this Easter tide we're living in right now, that's the question. Who is Jesus to me? Who is he? Is he a friend? Is he a life coach? Or is he my life? He doesn't, he doesn't give me hints. He is my life. He's not an attaboy on the back. He's my hope. He's not a suggestion. He's the truth. He lived a life I could never live. And because of faith in him, I no longer live. I died with him. And Christ now lives in me. And when we stand before the Lord, in the end, he's not going to ask, how often did you obey my son? He didn't ask, won't ask, what would Jesus do? He won't ask, did you try your best? He'll say, when you look at my son, who do you see? You see an object of scorn? You see a fool? You see someone you like and you're a fan of? Or do you see the Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the earth? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we ask that our hearts would be seared and pierced with the truth that to embrace Christ, to walk in Christ, to have life in Him, includes His cross. It includes the mystery that Jesus Christ actually took upon Himself every bit of our frailty and sin, every bit of our, our idolatry. He did these things. And at the same time, the same mechanism that took away our sin also imputed His good standing before you upon us so that He heard condemnation that day and we now hear acceptance. If we plead anything but the blood of Jesus, God help us. Nothing but the blood. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ that in that freedom, where we're no longer proving ourselves, no longer fighting scrappy, trying to, to make sure we have a, play, a place on the Southwest Airlines flight before anyone else takes them all, Instead, we trust that if we're in Christ, that you have taken up a place in heaven for us. We have an avatar waiting, keeping our spot for us. Where you are there, we shall be also. We don't have to defend ourselves. We don't have to earn our spot. We just have to trust in Jesus Christ. May that freedom, that okayness, enable us to be kind and generous, to lean toward outsiders, to share the gospel, and to recognize we have nothing to gain from this world. All we have is to give through the love of Christ Jesus. We love you, Father, and we thank you for revealing this truth, for Jesus personally defending it, and for the church to reside upon it for all these centuries. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.